This is Pascal's Restaurant and Hotel. Walking by it today, you'd never know its role as a meeting place for Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, and Stokely Carmichael, becoming so important that John Lewis would label it the unofficial headquarters of the civil rights movement. To understand how Pascal's became so important and how it has become so unrecognizable today, we have to go back to the 1930s, when brothers James and Robert Pascal were just beginning to make a name for themselves. Robert Pascal had just moved to Atlanta, Georgia, waiting tables at a cafeteria and serving at a soda fountain. Despite limited job prospects due to segregation, he rose to prominence in the black social scene of the city, eventually earning the moniker Mayor Pascal. Meanwhile, his brother James remained in their hometown of Thonsum, Georgia, a rural community near Augusta, operating a paper route, vegetable market, several shoeshine stands, mail order cosmetic sales, and a small convenience store. Uh, I sold uh, canned goods and ice cream and candy and the first ice cream and candy and canned goods some some other groceries after serving in world war ii in a brief stint as a pullman porter james and robert pascal reunited in atlanta pulling their saving to open a sandwich shop named pascal's in 1947. using their mother's fried chicken recipe robert pascal served as the restaurant cook while James Pascal handled the administrative side of the business. The restaurant quickly became popular with the students at the nearby Spelman, Clark Atlanta, and Morehouse Colleges. In addition, the restaurant quickly gained popularity with other patronage, black businessmen and politicians that were barred from downtown restaurants by segregation. However, unlike these downtown restaurants, Pascal's did not practice segregation in open defiance of laws forbidding integrated restaurants. Instead, Pascal's acted as a common ground where black and white Atlantans could come together, meet, talk, or debate the news of the day. For me, it's been an educational institution in that uh, I've met every bee and wannabe in black America right here at, uh, at this institution. And for me, it's been an education, um, and it still is. Um, and the fact that the uh, you can hold uh, intelligent conversations with uh, the folk who frequent this place, uh, I find appealing. When you come through here, you know, you will be challenged, <laughs> regardless of what your subjects are. If it's mathematics, then we have ma other mathematicians in here who would also challenge you. If you're a minister, then you would also be ordained or you would be challenged <laughs> according to your, your doctrine. And if you are a school teacher, the same thing applies, is that you would have to give an account of your students. Uh, if you are a contractor, excuse me, if you are a contractor, then, then oftentimes you will be challenged. So there are really no sacred subjects. There are no sacred subjects inside of the coffee shop. If you come in here, we'll get you. In 1959, its growing success, the restaurant moved across the street, and the following years, the La Carousel Jazz Club and a hotel were added. As the complex expanded, so did its role. Well, I think that Pasco's has always been the gathering place. And uh, it was the 60s, though, where the students and the community leadership began to hold meetings here and where much of the strategy of the civil rights movement and almost all of the politics tended to evolve. Atlanta's civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young, Julian Bond, and John Lewis, most of whom were already Pascal's regulars, planned many well-known campaigns in halter rooms and booths at Pascal's. A lot of the decisions were made here at Pascal's before, when I say decisions, I mean decisions to the strategy that were used when they go on marches to civil rights leaders. And many, many times Dr. King would regroup his people here to plan their next march. 
Among the most notable campaigns planned at Pascal's are the Selma Montgomery marches, the March on Washington, Mississippi Freedom Summer, and the Poor People's Campaign. But Pascal's wasn't just a meeting place for the high-level planning of the civil rights movement. Uh, years ago, uh, the, the students would be arrested in the downtown areas when they were having the sit-ins, and of course their parents would uh, come to Pascal's to wait for them here until they were released from jail. Throughout this time, the restaurant was acting as an example of what a desegregated South could be. At La Carousel Jazz Club, black and white singers performed to integrated audiences, and patrons of the restaurant were purposely seated next to members of the opposite race. It was a white couple. I'd bring a black couple over and stick them with them, and i say, uh, oh, what is your name? And he'd say, I'm Bill. And then I, and, and he'd say, I'm John, or whatever his name was, and by the time Bill would stand up and say, this is my wife, and he said, this is my date, and next thing you know, they were just exchanging drinks. Despite the peaceful nature of the restaurant, the FBI surveilled it at least once, and there were common fears that police or white supremacists would take action against the restaurant. Despite these dangers, Pascal's remained as one of the few public places where black and white leaders could publicly meet to discuss the important issues of the day. In the wake of desegregation, Pascal's carried on with a large integrated customer base, but one that was still smaller than before. Many gatherings and events migrated to the large downtown restaurants and hotels the Pascal brothers had fought so hard to desegregate. However, the restaurant persisted, continuing its role as a political kingmaker. Black leaders continued to use the facilities as a staging ground for social justice activities and local and national politicians recognized it as a place to speak to their constituents. Following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, mourners gathered at the restaurant and gathered there again for a post-funeral meal. The, the last time I saw Martin Luther King Jr. alive was right here in this room uh, in March of 1968, a month before he was assassinated. Uh, he was discussing and planning the Poor People's Campaign. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, black and white civic and religious groups continued to meet at Pascal's, as did many national politicians. Jesse Jackson launched his 1984 and 1988 presidential campaign at Pascal's, and Jimmy Carter, Hubbard Humphrey, Richard Nixon, and Bill Clinton all visited Pascal's during the presidential campaigns. During this time, the Pascal brothers expanded to an additional location in the Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport. However, the health of Robert Pascal was declining, and in response, the Pascal brothers made the decision to close the restaurant. In 1996, the restaurant, jazz club, and hotel were sold to Clark Atlanta University for $3 million to be used as a restaurant, conference center, and student dormitories to be named the Pascal Center. Even though the old staff were being kept and the building would remain, it was recognized that the filling of the restaurant would permanently be altered. Robert Pascal died the following year at age 88. After his brother died, James Pascal set into motion plans to reopen the restaurant and did so in 2002, a few miles from the original location. At the same time, Clark Atlanta University was having problems with the Pascal Center, posting a half million dollar a year in losses. To halt this loss, they closed the center in 2003 and announced plans to demolish the structure, even receiving a permit to do so. However, following national outcry and the 11th hour preservation effort, the entire complex was protected from demolition. While the building remains, it has not been cared for since the center closed, undergoing what is known as demolition by neglect. Nearly all the windows have been broken out and boarded up and the interior walls and ceilings have collapsed, leaving debris piled inside. Water has made its way into the building, causing further severe damage. Perhaps at this point, more than any other, the future of this structure is uncertain. James Pascal passed away in 2008, and very few of Pascal's notable patrons are still alive. Now, just as time is running out to record the history of Pascal's from those who worked, ate, and strategized there, 
Time is running out to save the very building itself that shepherded in the greatest wave of social progress in American history.